Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And we have a great guest. Uh, We actually, she's coming back. We had her about two months ago, and we were talking about anorexia and, and all the things that she can do to tap into your subconscious to overcome that. And in response to... Uh, Why we have her on today is because today is May 23rd, and for those in the state over this weekend or next Monday will be Memorial Day. And, you know, while people are out barbecuing, it is important to know about the troops, so on and so forth. And with that in mind, Beverly is going to talk about PTSD, and she has some cutting-edge research and implementation that she's been incorporating to help others overcome PTSD. So... Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the personal coach to your subconscious of my envisioned mind, Beverly Searle from Australia. Welcome, Beverly. Thank you for having me again. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks thanks for coming back on. Yeah, the the first thing um, I think we need to state is, I mean, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and it's in, in the news all the time, soldiers and people are having it. But so what exactly is it and what causes it? See, this is needing to understand how the brain works. I mean, it, it literally is what the name says. It's post, that means after trauma. So if you've experienced any form of trauma, you can have uh, flashbacks and reminders to that trauma and they can come in the forms of dreams or actually when you get a trigger, like uh, a car backfires or you get a smell of something, uh, you, it activates the flight-flight mechanism in the brain and replays the DVD in your brain. And you have, uh, you have the whole scenario come into your subconscious mind with all the fear and the negative emotions. And you, this can be happening any time and you have no control over it. And the soldiers, they're, they're committing suicide because no one can stop the, um, the flashbacks. No one can stop it. In Australia, we have more soldiers committing suicide than we have who've died in the war. That's horrendous statistics. Wow. So I would, yes, it's it's just horrendous. They've got the top psychologists, they've got the top people around, and they and the researchers are out there, and they can't stop the flashbacks. And that's what I've spent the last twenty years researching is stopping the flashbacks. So. Um, My work is revolutionary. I've just uh, finished uh, a research project uh, from which with a university PhD student from America. Took, uh, we did some in America and some here in Australia on Skype. And I did 10 hours with each person. And in those 10 hours, we worked with um, alleviating the post-traumatic stress, also bringing depression, anxiety, stress down to normal. And... Then six months later, we tested again. So they had a pre, post, and then six months later, nine out of nine or all cured. Never heard of before. And this is what I'm offering the world. Uh, But the only problem is I'm an independent researcher. I, uh, I don't have a drug company or a government or a business behind me who will pay for all this research. I've done it on my own back because I'm absolutely committed to helping people who have been traumatized. I was traumatized, heavily traumatized in the child, in my childhood. And when the flashbacks come, all they said was, well, you're hysterical. Um, take these heavy drugs and you'll be on them for the rest of your life. And I just said, no, this is impossible. This has happened to me. There must be a way. I spent nine years at university and seven years volunteering in organizations until I came up with this 
my process, my Envision Mind, and now it's time to get it out to the world. Let the let these soldiers, these men who, and women who put their lives on the line for us and are now suffering, let's let's alleviate it for them. Let let us get their lives back. Let them celebrate the rest of their life, not be hurt and by the trauma being flooding back and not coping mm-hmm. whatsoever with their lives. Yeah. Yeah. So my um my process isn't about talking. And this is where uh the difference between my process and the psychologists and psychiatrists is that therapy today is talking therapy. There is a few different things out there. But most of it is talking. Now, talking is good because you can understand what's happened to you, uh, come to terms mm-hmm. with it a little bit. But the talking does not affect the pictures in the mind because this is where I'm going to talk theory because I'm very much into empowerment and, and um, education. I mean, if you're going to do this therapy or any therapy, you need to know how your mind works. And as I say to my clients, you need to have, trust your own mind, trust the process and trust me. So we'll go straight into why talking doesn't cure PTSD. Now, you probably all understand about the flight, flight, freeze mechanism we have in our brains. Yeah. That's, yes. uh, yeah, that's, that's because our brains are geared for survival. So um, I use the example, the, uh, when you're three years old and your big brother drops a hairy spider on your shoulder and you run around screaming, to you, that's trauma, that's life-threatening. So that has activated the flight-flight mechanism. In probably a millionth of a second, the whole scenario as a DVD goes across into the limbic system. Now, the limbic system is the emotional seat of the mm-hmm. brain, and it was only in, in 1995-ish that they've actually had uh, Bessel van der Kolk, a top Harvard professor, had his soldiers, his rape victim, his, his car accidents. They had their flashbacks in the PET scan and they found out that the memory went into the limbic system. It wasn't like normal memory. And it's only since then has the, we've been able to fully understand what PTSD is. So going back to you at three years old running around screaming because your brother teased you by dropping a hairy plastic spider on you, that whole scenario gets lodged in the limbic system because that's danger for you. So every time you see a hairy spider or something drops accidentally on your shoulder, your brain goes instantly into the instinct. You can't control it. And the instinct, um, will, the message will go straight into the limbic system, replay the DVD of you running around screaming, and all the emotions flood through because the limbic system is the emotional seat of the brain. So you can have, um, this will develop into a phobia of spiders, panic attacks when you see one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the the, also, the fascinating thing about the limbic system, one, it doesn't have language. You know, this is the mind. It's a wonderful thing. The, the limbic system doesn't know there's a language system in the mind. So uh, it's all in pictures. And the other thing is it doesn't have time. So you could be three years old and, have, and get scared by the spider and could be 83 and still have a fear of spider. So that's why our soldiers are suffering. These pictures are in the limbic system. They're activated by anything, by a trigger of anything which can uh, bring back the memory because the the brain is on alert all the time for your survival. So because it's on alert, you get a trigger of any sort. And the, the amazing thing is smell is one of the biggest triggers because when you, um, smell is the only thing with sense that doesn't have a gate into the um, the brain. All their, all our other senses go through to the back of the brain and then go into the limbic system where smell goes directly into the system. There's no gateway. So if you, that's where uh, smell can trigger off so quickly because there's no gateway to help you get some control. So this is the heartbreak of people suffering from post-traumatic stress. It's got nothing to do with you being a weak person or just get over it, uh, you know, happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, get over it. You can't. 
because that's the way the brain is there. It's there for your survival. You've experienced things which were life-threatening to you. The information is in a DVD in your limbic system and it replays every time you get a trigger. And that's why our poor soldiers and, and that are committing suicide. That's why they're not coping. And also when they're in that trigger, they act out. So um, they believe, like the um, Rambo movie was the Lester Stone. He, he got the trigger and he thought he was back in, in Vietnam. So that literally can happen. The people can be in the, the triggered form and react to what's happening to them. And that's where they can, you know, we think they've gone berserk. But what they, they haven't, what they've done is they're back living the past. And it's, it's horrible to think that these people are having to cope with this all day, every day. They can't even get away from it with their dreams when they're asleep. Sometimes it makes it worse. So um, that is why my commitment to help people get over trauma. Because it's such a, it's something that's happened to you. It has been out of your control and you're suffering because of it. And literally, it's not fair, is it? <laughs> so the, uh, yeah. you put your life on the line, you help people, and now you're suffering from it. So um, yeah. so will I go straight into um, how my therapy works? Would you like to try uh, but, it? Or would you have yeah, any but, questions you'd like to ask? I actually have some questions, but I think that okay. without, without further ado, I, I'd rather go into your, your sample and then go okay. into the question. So let, let's okay. do that first. Okay. Now, Mind Vision Mind is a nine-step process, and the first five steps is the process of getting your mind safe and happy because that's one thing you don't have. Um, most people don't have a safe and happy mind, especially if you've had trauma. So what we do is it's a visualization because you can't use words to access the limbic system, so it has to be a visualization. So it's a guided visualization where you're in control. It is not hypnotism. So um, if one of you could do this and give me construct, or both of you, <laughs> so give me constructive feedback, it would be great. Now, okay. the, um, the other thing is that uh, what I haven't brought up, so I'll bring it out now before we start, is that I've integrated the trauma research from um, Professor Van der Koop and the psychosynthesis, which is a 70-year-old personality theory which was not accepted by mainstream psychiatry and psychology because in the 1920s, 30s, she brought in Eastern philosophy, which they're only bringing in now. Most of you would probably have heard of mindfulness and yoga and meditation. Well, he brought those sorts of things in in the 1930s and it was never accepted. So I found this in my search for something that works and I've integrated it in to my work. So you have, um, your, sub your subpersonalities are your moods and your roles. They're um, parts of you would hold the memory. So when you're born, I'll do this very quickly. So when you're born, you're hardwired everywhere to learn and study, but you've never lived in this body before. So you need to have a way of storing your lived experience, the things you do in your body. So it's saying the, mem the um, example I use, you're three years old and you're given a little red tricycle and um, you're so excited and you put your leg over it. Now, this is the first time you've ever ridden a tricycle. So the, the moment you've done it, puts your leg over it's a new experience a spark goes off in your mind and it holds that lived experience of riding a bike so that's the role of that it creates a sub personality and that's its role so it's a part of you and it has the role of riding your bike so every time you get on the bike you that sub personality comes forward because they're all there you have access to them but most of the time you have to do the action to get them to come forward so going on with having a three-year-old three riding a bike, you've created a um, bike riding sub-personality. So every time you get on the bike, this one comes forward and as years go by, you get to two-wheeler and then you, um, you think this is great and then 16, 17, you get that magical thing called a car and the bike goes into the shed and then years can go by and you see a bike and you'll say, oh, I used to ride a bike and then you get on the bike and then wobble, wobble, wobble and then click that subpersonality comes forward 
and you can ride the bike. So this is where um, not only do you have in the limbic system the picture of the trauma, but you also have the part of you, the subpersonality or ego state trapped in there. So when they, you get the trigger, say, for example, for the spider, and you see another spider and it activates the flight flight, what you're doing is that three-year-old is running around screaming in the DVD in your um, subconscious mind, your limbic system, and that's why all the negative emotions can come through. So with the soldiers, the soldier's subpersonality is trapped in the DVD in their mind, and we get the soldier out of it and the pictures out of it and the PTSD goes. Uh, it's as simple as that. I can do it in night, 10 hours. So what we're looking at is we've got the subpersonality in the limbic system, and that's what we're going to do now with the uh, learning the process. The power of visualization is incredible because the subconscious mind does not but does not differentiate between you being somewhere or you visualizing it. And that's why meditation works. Because if you visualize yourself on the beach and, you know, you're um, on a hammock in the gentle breeze, your subconscious mind believes you're doing it. So it sends all the good vibes and everything to your body. So this is the wonderful thing what I found out is that the visualization we're doing, your body believes you're doing it. And then all the, uh, the good vibes and everything happens, comes through to it. So this is tapping into all the different ways the brain works and, and um, being able to pull this all together. Now, I have a lot of people say to me, um, I can't visualize. Hopeless, Adam. So I say to them, can you imagine? So here's a test for you both. Can you imagine yourself down the beach and you've got some chips and you, or French fries, as you call them, and you show them to the seagulls and they come fighting and cawing to get, get the uh, French fries? Can you imagine that in your mind? Yes. Yes. Great. Right. Do you see it in color? Yes. Good. Yes. Some people only see in black and white, and some people only see in still slides, like a slide will come then another one. It, it, it doesn't matter which way you can do it, as long as you can see it. Um, it works. Okay. So let's begin. I'm, I'm, as you can see... I'm, uh, I've got my slides up here because I'm not being able to um, put uh, slides up for you to see pictures and everything. I have to do a little bit more talking, which doesn't seem to worry me so much, does it? <laughs> so, okay, first thing we do. So we know the subconscious mind, uh, when you visualize it, it works. We know you've got uh, subpersonalities living in the limbic system holding your trauma, and it's all in picture form. So the first thing to make in your mind is, safe and happy is to pick a place in the world which is a retreat where you would like to have find your home with all your, where your subpersonality this is the happiness so for example my retreat is on the um, coast of um, Queensland Australia which is semi-tropical I've got a it's on a, a little cove that comes in and I've got my beautiful place there and I have the whales come in, and it's just a beautiful place there. It, it doesn't have to be a literal place, because I can't literally go to this. There's no in uh, Queensland, but it needs to be a real retreat, not something on Mars. And that you're the only one to live in this, so you need to, it needs, um, if it's like a retreat in Bali or up in the mountains or somewhere like that, uh, it, it can't be in a town. It needs to be a retreat. So, have you chosen one? Yes. yes. Okay. So, I mean, this isn't private information. So, um, th th this is uh, a wonderful place for you to go. So, uh, what I want you to do now is we have to have a process to go into the limbic system, into the visualization, and come out. And I use a plane because it's the, the one most people um relate to. I have people who are petrified of planes, so they won't use a plane. I've had someone use a unicorn and another person drive in. So it's the process that counts. You need a way to get into the um, to your retreat and out. So board a one person plane which knows where to go 
and then take off. And in the distance, you'll see your retreat. And we, it's not like you've got to go five hours to Hawaii on the um, on the plane. This is instant. As, yet, as we know, there's no time in the limbic system. So when you can see your retreat, I want the plane to land on the outskirts, like a track or a road, or if it's at the beach, um, on the beach. So let me know when you're landed, and then I can talk you through from there. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. okay, great. You're doing this wonderfully. So you've got five steps on the plane. So you let the steps down, and you're going five, four, three, two, one, and you step out. Uh, now that we're using the the numbers and going down to help you get into a meditative state. So I want you to look around, make sure you're safe, and make sure there's no one else there. It's a beautiful sunny day, and just walk around and sit, look around and say, this is my retreat. See the trees, the flowers, the water. Now I want you to listen to something. Can you hear the waves or the wind in the trees or the birds? Yeah. Okay, now yep. I want you to touch something. Pick something up, a stone, hug a tree, something like that. We're bringing in the senses to make it stronger. Okay, now I want you to smell something. Smell a flower or the air. Can you smell the salt? Can you smell the uh, flowers? Yeah. And when you've got, when you've got that smell, um, is there a taste coming into your mouth? Is it, you know, getting a taste of saltiness or sweetness? If you can't get all of it, you, it, it, it comes with practice. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now, I want you to look around. Yeah, that's good. You both got it. So look around. And I want you to walk around. You know you're safe. There should be no one there because this is your home, your retreat, your head, your mind. So you, as you walk around, you're going to come across a path. Got it? Now, it could be yeah. a little bit overgrown. Right, you've got a path. Now, I want you to follow the path, and it will come to a clearing, and there'll be some form of building there. Now, I call it the home and the head, but this home could be, you've set it up around about three years old. It could be out of a picture book. It could be the home you grew up with or a grandpa or grandparents' home. It could be anything from a log cabin to a temple. So walk down the path. Let me know if there's rocks or anything in the way and you can't get there. Most people can just walk straight down and they come to a clearing and then they find see a building there. So let me know when you've done it or if you have a hiccup. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Okay, fantastic. You're both doing this brilliantly. This is how simple it is. No big drama with this work. <laughs> so I want you to walk up to the house. Now, um, you're not to go into this home. What you're doing, you're like a real estate person and you're going to walk around it and you're going to look at it and make it three-dimensional in your head. What's it made of? Brick, stone, timber. Are the windows in good condition? Do you have a front door with steps or a, a veranda? What's the roof made of? Thatch, timber, shingles, corrugated iron. Now, just slowly walk around, go to the right, have a look. Now, normally I get you to tell me if there's anything wrong, but that's, we don't do this. You, you have a little workbook given to you, and you write down everything you see in the workbook. It's included in the kit or the therapy. So you walk around the side. You come up, um, There could be the windows are broken or it needs painting or there's a hole in the roof. Come around to the back. Are there, is there a back door? Is the house in a good condition? And then walk around the other side again and come back to the front. Because the condition the house is in is the condition what uh, is affected by what's happened to you in your life. So once you've got this process in and you go in weekly to check that everything is all right, if you have a fire go through or something like that, it means that you've had some trauma in your life and by fixing it in your mind, in your home, in the head, it fixes the, the, takes the negative experiences out of your mind. 
And you can use this process for the rest of your life. It just works brilliantly. I mean, I've been doing it for 20 years and I still use it. So, um, so you walked around the house, you know what your house is. Now, what I want you to do is to walk back towards the plane because now we've got a home where your subpersonalities live. Now we're going to make it, and it's a beautiful place. The retreat is, we're going to make it safe. So walk back towards the plane, there, a couple of meters away or a couple of yards away. Turn and face the way you've come. And now what we're going to do is put a fence and wrap it completely around your property and it needs to be big and strong and tall enough that nothing can go over, under or through it. So brick, um, stone, high timber. I've had the odd person who doesn't like um, to see a big fence. So I said put a secure, uh, swimming pool security around it. You know the glass? So it's there, yeah. but you can't see. You can see through it and it doesn't block the view. So it's your choice, but it needs to be big and strong enough. You can put razor wire on top. Depends what your life is. I mean, my mum, when she did this process, wanted to have a little white picket fence. I said, mum, don't do this. Silly. Anyone can walk over that. It has to be strong. <laughs> so this is to stop people physical coming over. You know, a picket fence, anyone can get through. It needs to be a security fence. And you only have one gate. And the gate is... Uh, on the path so you can have as much land as you like and because this isn't um, no trauma nothing in your brain is set in concrete you can come back and say well I want the property to be bigger I want to have a forest and I want to have mountains and water so next time you come back you can add to it so um, fence it all off have the one gate on the path so when you get off the plane you come straight to the gate now, this is where the safety comes through. You need to have a security which only allows you to go through into your property, into your mind. Your mind, you're in control. So it can be a thumbprint, eye recognition, voice recognition, digital number, a key that you hang around your neck or keep in your pocket. I had one little boy of nine. He wanted a spit. So he had a little slide thing, he spat on it and put it in the little mechanism on the gate and that opened it. So, I mean, allow people to do it the way they want to. I mean, it's your mind. Uh, what security you would like suits you. It's the process. So put the security in, walk through the gate, shut the gate behind you. The gate is always shut. And also put the security to get out because this is your mind and you're in control of it. So you dictate who comes in and out of your mind. So you have the security. Okay, you've been able to do that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Easy, isn't it? <laughs> so now what I want you to do is we've got physical protection, but we need to have something which for psychic or spiritual protection, something coming through the air. There's lots of people out there uh, doing all sorts of uh, witchcraft, uh, curses, uh, all sorts of things. So we need to... Ha um, Protect our mind spiritually or psychically. So um, under your belief system, what would you put in the air or to protect anything from coming? And I'll give you some examples. Like with my home in the head, I have a dome. And the dome covers my whole property. And the dome is made of little sparkly crystals. So it reflects or cuts through anything negative trying to get to me. So that's what I've done. I've had a man put a Black Hawk helicopter up. I've had people put angels. I've had other people put a Buddha. Uh, whatever. I've had uh, kids put rainbows and dream catchers. You can tell they haven't had big trauma. <laughs> so, um, so whatever your belief system, whatever your belief system, because it's your belief, your faith, which stops anything from coming through. I had angels with the uh, cherubs, which were the uh, the ones who guarded the Garden of Eden, and they had swords, flaming swords, and they could move in any direction. So when I first did this and was getting my mind safe and happy, I used four cherubs on the corners of my property until I knew I was safe. So um, it, it is your belief system. Now, normally I get you to tell me, but you don't have to. You can jot it down. And next time or whatever you like so you put your security in ok 
Okay. Got okay. it? Right, okay. Now, some people say, uh, I've had one person say, I don't have any spirituality. I only believe in the earth. So um, I said to her, well, in the olden days, they used to have garlic around their um, neck and that used to ward off evil. And so she said, oh, I'll put a roll of garlic around my property. That'll do it because of her belief system. So um, what happens is a lot of my first clients, a lot of them, uh, I've had a few people come out of cults or fundamental religions where they had a lot of brain control over them. So I do this with everyone, and you might not ever need to have it there, but it's lovely to know that you're being got, um, protected by this. And when I was running groups for women, I had about 50 women go through for depression, and one woman pulled me aside after we did this, and she said, I want to thank you, Beverly. I've been under psychic attack for years and years and years. I've never been able to stop it. Putting this process in stopped it. So it's, I mean, I just love the thought that I had angels there looking after me. So it's there. Now, um, so you've, you've just done one and a half steps of my process. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put in a healing process so that you can come back and visit whenever you like and, and just use it for stress relief. So what, just inside the gate, I want you to put in a beautiful shower. It would be glass, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to have a tap because the shower is run by the subconscious mind. Now, um, I use the colors of the rainbow so you can choose a color. Um, like if you're stressed, you might want to have green or um, a purple or red. So whatever color you want, that you can change the shower. So what you do is you think of something which has been affecting you or, you know, you might be a bit down, uh, a bit flat, so you might want to put bright, sparkly, crystals in it so what we do we don't use water we use um you know when you use a wand uh the blue fairy uses the wand harry potter and the sparkles come out of them the little diamantes so that's what we use for healing because the um you need to have a picture form of the healing so when you step into the shower so think of something you might be a bit flat so you might want to put uh red for energy so you step into the it's a shower and it'll automatically come on when you go in and you stand underneath the the dimentes I call them and have the colored dimentes go over and through you see because you're a holograph when you see the picture of yourself in there you can actually see and this is the beauty of the work because you can say to somebody you're depressed and um I say well where is the depression held in your body and they say well I've got a big black part in my brain and my heart's black because I feel unloved. So you have the dementes come over and you go over your and through your mind and wash away the depression out of the blackness out of your body in any place. And then I, um, and that washes away and relieves a lot of the stress, depression or whatever you've got. Or you can boost yourself up by having energy come into you. So just stand there for a few seconds and just feel it. Okay, so we, that's the first two steps of my work. So you can come back whenever you like. So uh, turn around, use your security to come out. Shut the gate behind you. Get on the plane and fly back here and then settle yourself and open your eyes. Cool beans. Yeah. Right. So, nice. I mean, if you if we'd had time, you could have stayed there for five minutes, you know, and just be in the state and have it, it washed away. And I did this for a woman and she took it home and did it with her husband without any of the other things. She said, just think of a beautiful place in your mind. And, and she just described it without, you know, the theory or anything. And he'd been held up at gunpoint in war. And he was fearful and had been fearful ever since then for the for 20 odd years. He was from uh, Croatia. So that was a war a long time ago. And he did this and he stepped into the shower and washed away his fear. And from that day forward, he hasn't had any fear. 
That's mm. how powerful this process is. So you're doing it all in picture form. So you can come and um, just remember the way you've done it. Uh, make notes, you know, you fly in, use your security, walk, go into the shower. Now the ruling is don't have, don't go into the house because we don't know what's in the house. You know, the purpose of this is to find you have got a sub you have got a home, and you have sub, you should have sub personalities living there. A lot of people don't. They've had a lot of trauma. No one's living in the house, so this is where you need support, either with me or we have a kit going, which we'll talk at the end where you can. You can hear my voice and talk you through exactly what I've done with a workbook and the illustrations and everything that makes it a little bit easier. So from from there, we start, uh, uh, we do work on the home, we design it all, we change everything, and then you start meeting your different sub-personalities. And I try to do that in the first session so the person feels immediately some relief. And within 10 hours, the PTS is gone, the um, depression, anxiety, stress, or anything else you want to work with is, is handled. And that's what we're, I'm offering. That's my work, my vision, mine. So constructive feedback and, and questions. Yeah, I have a question, uh, Beverly. So as, you know, a person is working through, uh, using these techniques and working through stuff, would they find that every time they go like let's say they go get on their plane and they land, you know, wherever yep. that place is, they land, go down the path, use the security. And when they get to the house, will they find the house changing every time as they work and work through stuff and no changing? Uh, yes. Now, what happens is that um, I say to people they're not to do anything with the home unless I'm there or you've got the kit in front of you because it will change. Because you know how I said to use the little dimensions from the wand. Uh, yeah. or um, a staff or something, I actually, that's what uh, we use to change the home. So it, um, you could, if the uh, house is old and decrepit and, and needs a paint job, you just cover the whole home with the dimensions and the, the subconscious mind will heal the, the home and change it. When we go okay. in and we make, when we go in and make rooms for everybody, the, ch the child parts of you, the, uh, we have um, a coach I used to call it the housekeeper. So there's a part of you called the inner self-helper, uh, which knows everything about you. And you can actually meet him or her and get them in the home. So they're your counselor best friend for the rest of your life. So after you've got done that stage, you can go in and talk to your housekeeper and um, your coach. And then you'll say, oh, I'm a bit depressed or something. What's going on? And they'll literally tell you what to do to help you get well. So you've got a... a a friend, a counsellor, a coach there for the rest of your life, you can use you. I, I'm using mine for over 20 years. She has a name and I can talk to her whenever I like. So this is the beauty of the process lasts forever. And you can um, keep using it or not using it. I'm just working with somebody who hasn't used it for three years and it's all there. We just She had a hiccup in her life and I helped her through that. So it's there. But you need to do the visualization to get there because we're deliberately going into the limbic system. But the kits all with me talking uh, and uh, counseling you, we can do it all. But don't do it yourself because you never know what's behind the door. So um, it's, it, it, this was um, to demonstrate that you can do the process and you have, you have it there. So it's a matter of just going back and doing it. And you can use it as a, a guided meditation just to help you on the day-to-day -day stresses in your life. Uh, so do you well, ultimately... Re go ahead, David. I was going to say, yeah, yes. you know, a lot of this completely makes sense, Beverly, because I'm, uh, I'm 53 years old, and when I was about, I don't know, it must have been about four, my mom had taken me to, to get some swimming lessons, and... I completely like freaked out. It was just overwhelming the experience being in the water and that was it. I had the one day and then that was it. She was like, well, I guess we got to wait because I was just too freaked out. So eventually I learned how to swim. I taught myself actually, but to this day I could be like at a public pool and just the sound and the smell of everything just lights up all that stuff. 
from when I was yep. in that, yep. when I was four years yep. old. Yeah, there's your smell, the chlorine smell and the looking yeah, at it. So exactly. what we would do with, with, yeah, with in your case, that when we've got the home safe fully um, done and you've met your, your coach, you actually meet, ask to meet the part of you who experienced it. And this is how we work with the soldiers or the firemen or anyone, the rape victim, anyone with trauma. So once the, that's the first four steps and you've done two of them already, is that you go in and ask to meet the part of you and, and nine times out of ten that part will come in and into the lounge room and talk to you so you'll meet the four-year-old and then you uh, we have a children's area so you take the four-year-old into the children's area with a nurturing mother and and that sort of thing all in there and you put put him through the shower and then you say to him you've had it tough um and so you, you look at the child and you say right what is the where is the fear stored? And you wash it away. I have a few more techniques. This is the simplistic way. I'm not giving away all my hints. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and, then you say, and then you say to him, what's the special gift you would like? So um, because you've had it tough and you've been scared for all this time. I mean, um, you're 50-something and you've still got that fear and it happened when you're four. So yeah. uh, he might want a puppy or he might want books or DVD or a canoe to go out on the, you know, whatever you ask him, what would he like? And then when the, shower, see, when the showers go off, it means the subconscious is telling you that, that the healing's finished. So you don't have to think, oh, I am, is this one in long enough? They stay in there until the showers go off. Then the little one's got his puppy or whatever, and he stays in the children's area uh, where he has nurturing people looking after him and he, and he won't ever hear or see or be influenced by the pool or the floor in anything again. That's it. That's a simple. There's a few more steps I do, but the, that's the sim, simple start step of a uh, a simple fear, but like a, a a single fear. But when you've got uh, soldiers, firemen, and people in the services, emergency services, where they have, um, like one of the firemen in my study was, had three firemen and then five women with um, armed hold up, sexual abuse, and harassment. Uh, he had um, 15 years of being on duty in a fireman, and I didn't realise how tough firemen get it. You know, they're cutting people down from committing suicide. They go to horrendous car crashes. Um, you know, the, it's day in, day out. Yeah. Um, trauma, a lot of these are doing. I like the, the soldiers may do three or five or six year um, a tour of duty, but firemen, police, and, and uh, the emergency services, they're living it all day, every day. So yeah. um, the, that we, you, know, you find the fireman, you find the soldier, and you can heal him, but there's other things happening there, what we, we work with, and that's all done in it. So that when you take the soldier out of the war and you take everything about the war out of the limbic system, they no longer have the post-traumatic stress. That's as, as simple mm -hmm. as that. As you can see, yeah. I'm dedicated. I just want this work out there. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. fire away with your question. Go ahead, Hamza. So I, yeah, so I, I was just thinking of a, a futuristic or, it's, I guess, real-time question with regards to PTSD. Uh, David and I were talking before, and I had jokingly said that I think I, under, I know how President Obama's hair turned gray because – it was pure black when he first started his presidency and when he left, it was, you know, a shot of gray. And the, and yes. what I have, I have referenced the movie good kill. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. It has uh, Ethan Hawke in it. And what they were doing, the movie had, had come out in 2014 for anybody listening to a podcast, want to check it out. I think it's great. And the fact that he, <clears throat> Ethan's character, he, he was in war, but, and he was a pilot, but, what happened was with technology being the way it is, they didn't need him to fly to Afghanistan and all these other places, you know, because it's just the, the chance that he can die or get captured and anything else. So anyway, he, they wind up using drones. And so they were killing people. They were here in the States, but they were using drones to kill people all over the world. And Initially, you're thinking, okay, if I'm in the war zone, you know, that's where the PTSD comes in. But he was having a lot of PTSD 
just from killing people remotely, you know, from a virtual standpoint. So I guess that's where my next question would be, because you were saying the nose and smelling and David's example, you know, in the future or even today, you wouldn't have those smells anymore associated with war because you're doing it remotely, but you would still have PTSD. So how would you address that? Yes, uh, you meet the one who has the PTSD. You always meet the one who's at, you ask to meet them. Like you can, okay. get, uh, a counselor can get um, precarious, I think they call it, um, PTSD by listening to um, horror stories in their therapies all the time with people. They actually get a secondary PTSD because of listening to it. So what you're doing is you 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 go in. There's a sub personality or ego state who's experienced. You go in and meet the one who's experienced it, and you heal them with more than just the one process I'm doing now. There's three or four processes I use, but you can see how it works. It's changing the picture. You take the picture and you take the sub personality ego state out of the situation. Now you still have the memory. Um, I had somebody come. Uh, say to me, but I still want to know what happened. I said, yes, that's fair enough, you can. But see, what the problem is, it's in the limbic system with all the emotions. So you still have the memory of the war and what's happened to you uh, in the frontal lobes of the brain, but there's no emotion there. So what happens is the emotional memory goes away and you just say, oh, this happened to me or that happened to me, but it doesn't have the emotions tied into it. So you still have the the um, memories and like with me with the childhood issues the memories fade because I'm not, I'm not bringing up I don't have to um, bring up or think of those things so I mean they're there in the frontal lobes but there's no um, uh, no emotion around it so you're not wiping out the complete memory of what's happened to you what you're doing is taking it out the limbic system which is the trauma what holds the trauma memory now that goes to the second part of the question so uh, a popular show on Netflix is a black mirror. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those. It's, it's pretty good. And, and, it, and they have a lot of different episodes, but how it pertains to this is they had people going to war turned territory. And again, in this example, they used like some type of pill or something. So there was no emotion to, or trauma. And what happened was since they would, you know, hit the switch and that trauma would go away it enabled them to go back into war. And so I guess that would be my next question. If somebody wants to remember it, but they don't have the that trauma associated with it, can they go back and kind of, in essence, do their job? Yes, they could, because uh, you could take take the soldier out of the, um, the picture of the trauma. But we have hundreds and thousands of subpersonalities, so he won't just have one soldier. Uh, sub-personality because um, a lot of the times with every job or uh, experience they have there's there's other soldier parts of him learning them so that when you ha you find the soldier who, who saw the you know the bomb destroy his best mate in front of him and that's the trauma when you um, heal him and the trauma he doesn't have to um, go back into the war he can but you then ask to meet the other soldiers or another part of him who has the skills and abilities who can come forward and be the soldier, take over the role of a soldier. It's getting it out of the limbic system. See, when you learn something, you um, you have different sub-personalities. You don't just have it with, with the one sub-personality. There's, there's three, four, five, or a half a dozen learning the skills. So you could, there will always be another one, two, three, four, five others there who can step up into the role if needed. So it's the person's decision. I mean, I, I say to people um, who've experienced the trauma, do you want this one to do it? And they said, no, he needs to or she needs to retire. She, she you know, can't be a firefighter or whatever anymore. So this one, we give them another, I, I call it sacking them, you fire them. You sack them, you put them through the healing process, you give them another job or another, they can be out in the hammock uh, by the pool having somebody giving them margaritas or something so that they're not in the situation. Then you go back in and ask to meet the, another part of them who can do the job. And there will always be another part come forward. There's always more than one, but it's the one who experienced the trauma which is getting the healing. So all the skills, all the abilities are still there in the different sub-personalities. And you can um, 
remove one out of the scene and there'll always be one, another one there. See, this is what happens when um, you have so many uh, child parts of you uh, running your mind is that the first time you feel, say, um, depression and you're three or four years old, that one's created to hold your depression. So every time you experience depression, that, that one comes forward and takes it. So the depression can get bigger and bigger and bigger and then take over your life. So when the... Um, you meet the one who holds the depression and it could be still three or four years old and you heal them and you let them be a kid and do fun things. There's always ones behind it. But but with the subpersonalities, ego space is that when the first one's created, that one is there first. You could have others behind it who are quite as capable to do it. But the other, it's an instant in a millionth of a second. So that one's out first. You take that one away out of the equation and they're healed there's always others behind it with better skills. You can and and uh, you can actually train. You can actually um, do a training in their mind so that all the skills go into this one. The mind is absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. Of what you can do, you can. Um, I mean, you're getting really deep therapy. What I'm saying, but we can you can take one out of the equation, bring another one forward, and give them all the skills to do it. I've done that okay. countless times with people. Does does this these techniques and process does does this work like with something like let's say if someone was trying to quit smoking? Yep. Smoking, weight loss, uh how to do better at school. Uh you organize the mind to uh in in the home, a special room in the home which has all the skills and abilities and the knowledge. And um, you can access it whenever you like. So it's the same with smoking. You find the one who's addicted and you go through the, all the healing processes. You, you look at all their, the social issues around it. I mean, do you have a cup of coffee with it always? So what do you do um, when you're having a coffee so you're not getting the cigarette? You know, uh, other people say it's that time out. They go outside and have a cigarette and it gives them time. So they, they you look at all the different social reasons why they're doing it. And you can wash away the addiction because of where it's stored and how it's done and also why you've done it. There can be a trauma behind it, why. So you look at all the aspects of it. So whatever, anything in your life you want to change or improve, it can be done with this process. Hmm. Let me ask you about when you're, uh, about being present. And so, you know, there's, few places where we feel that we're present one is war right you can't think of yep. you know what i ate last week you're in the present the other <laughs> i can think of is, is right the other i can think of is sex and hopefully you're present for that yep. <laughs> and then i would think of <laughs> right and then i would think of like football like the nfl is really big here and yep. you have so many people in in each of those instances where they're so like they feel so alive and when yeah. they're not doing yeah. that anymore, they feel like a shell of themselves. So after yeah. going through your training, what is it where they still feel like they can still be present even though they may not uh, participate partic in, in, in war or in the NFL and so on? Is there a way they can so, still feel that empowered? Yes. See, um, because this isn't talking therapy, uh, in the kit or, uh, or in the one-on-one, um, -on -one, I send um, a two-page questionnaire. And it's one is, the first question is your hobbies and work. The second one is, um, have you ever been adopted, fostered? Was your birth, uh, um, did you have difficulty at birth? Uh, and then it gives you major ages in your life, like zero to three, three to seven, that type of thing. And you list any trauma what's happened to you. So you can systematically go through and like if you've got a belief system that uh, you're useless or hopeless, um, uh, you can find the one who first took that belief on board and it's always a child. You know, the, um, I've got a woman I'm working with now, it's a, a Greek family and um, the father wanted a son and he, the wife had a baby every year and there was four girls before the son was born. And she, and then the son was everything and the girls were nothing. So she, all her life, she's got this viewpoint is that she's no good because she's a girl. And it's in, uh, interfered and affected her whole life and who she is. So we're working, we're finding the original one. 
who felt that. And then we're working through the different issues. Uh, and uh, every time she starts saying something, I say, right, who's saying it? And you can work through, you can undo it. You can reparent yourself because you can put in the nurturing mother. You can put in the good father. So I've had people who've um, never been loved or hugged by a man because the father was not present. And uh, I can bring the one woman, um, she said, I want to feel the love of a good father. And I've never had it in my life. And I said, she was a very uh, strict uh, Christian. I always ask, always work within the Christian, the belief systems of the person. I said, who in you could give love? And she said, Jesus. I said, remember the scripture what says, suffer to me, little children, come to me. I said, look, have Jesus there in a seat and have all the little child parts you go up and sit on his lap and laugh and, and have hugs from him. Within a week, she felt a man's love. She felt the love come right through a whole, a whole body. And she could feel the, the, the nurturing father's love. And this is what you can do. You can literally undo all those belief systems that are forced on you as a child. The, the voice in your head what's yelling and screaming at you that you're a useless, so good son of, you know, and what's the point of you being alive, which, you know, we've, people have got that in their heads. When you evict the voice what's saying it, the father and that, he'll be... That's why we keep getting your mind safe and happy because there'll be people in there, the negative people, you have to evict them out of your head. When you evict them off your property, the voice stops. Mind-blowing, isn't it? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm looking at the time and I love talking to you guys and I know it's only an hour. Look, what we're doing is, this is the hard sell from my viewpoint, um, on our uh, website, we're going to put in a special, our kits are $50 each. We've got a PTSD kit and we've also got a PTSD ebook. So if you um, come on the website, mindvisionmind.com or Bev send me an email, uh, Beverly at mindvisionmind, we're going to give everyone who comes from your podcast the kit for $40. Uh, and so they need to just send an email saying um, we've heard it on the podcast we want the special deal you can get the right. ebook for free so um and that explains about ptsd and how i work uh and also i'm available and one other person in america who's trained is available to work with people directly now we that's normally um 997 for the 10 hours of therapy and we're knocking a hundred um dollars off of that so um just people on the hear this Go on the website and say you heard it on the podcast and you want the discount. And it lasts for uh, the podcast. The discount will last until um, a month, which is the end of June. Okay. So that um, people can have, you know, if you find that the kit isn't, a lot of people have complex needs and the kit mightn't be enough, then we take the price of the kit off your, any therapy you have later on. So we're, people will... Let's get people well. Let's get our soldiers well, our firemen, our policemen. You know, they're, they're putting their lives online for us. Yeah. Yeah. Any last questions, oh. David? Um, no, I think uh, we covered a lot. <laughs> we did, and, and hopefully everyone got enough of those two steps and, and we definitely want to know more. I mean, we missed seven, so... Obviously, we had an impact with the two. I mean, that's only part of the, the visualization technique. So definitely, you're very gracious for giving that offer for our listeners. I appreciate it. And I want to thank you for your time, Beverly. I love talking to you both. Awesome. Yes. You, you've yeah. been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I'm David. And happy Memorial Day to those that are celebrating in the United States, and thanks for making the podcast, Beverly. Thank you. All the best to everybody. Thanks, cheers. Bye. Listen to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective on Radio Public. It's a free, easy-to-use app that helps listeners like you find and support shows like ours. When you listen to our show on Radio Public, 
we receive direct financial support every time you hear an episode. Experience our show and radio public today by listening to the show link in our episode notes, and thank you for listening. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.